Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is David Holton, and my excuse for being here is that um, I chair the BSA Committee on Society, Arts, and Letters. So now it's time for a bit of culture, uh, Philhellenism as culture. And we have three speakers whom I will introduce one by one before they give their papers. The second speaker is online, but I hope that uh, connection will go uh, smoothly. Um, and at the end, after the three speakers have given their presentations, I will invite questions. So let's begin, first of all, with um, Spiridula Dimitriou, who completed her PhD in art history uh, at the University of Melbourne in Australia. After obtaining a bachelor's degree in economics, she undertook postgraduate... Did I say economics? Yes, yes. Yeah. I started off as an economist. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a good life skill. <laughs> it's written down here, so I'm reading it. Uh, then she went on to do postgraduate studies in modern Greek language and literature. Uh, an interest in politics, Greek history and culture then prompted her to undertake a doctoral thesis on Mesolonghi and Philhellene art. The thesis investigates how a formulaic and coherent narrative of revolutionary Mesolonghi emerged in Philhellene art to argue in favor of Western intervention in the 1821 Greek War of Independence. Spiridula's title is Philhellene Art and Mesolonghi as the Crucible of the Greek Revolution Globally. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and I hope you didn't have too much trouble getting here today. The international range of Philhellene visual responses to revolutionary Mesologi demonstrate that propaganda involving the town coalesced into a larger narrative arguing that the Greek cause for liberty from Ottoman rule was worthy of Western support. After the fall of Mesologi on the 11th of April, 1826, and the conspicuously valiant exodus of the town's last offenders on that night, a formulaic and coherent narrative of revolutionary misologi emerged in Philhellene art. An orientalist proclivity, French liberal politics, and Western religious art were fundamental elements in the visual language utilised by Philhellene artists. Also central to the establishment of this consistent narrative were the themes of the Christian identity of the Greek insurgents and the nobility of the vanquished hero. My paper today will examine printed works which elevated the town as the crucible of the Greek revolution on the white stage. My intention is to convey the importance of print culture in the development of revolutionary misologi in art. The material I'm presenting was gathered as part of my research for my PhD undertaken in the Department of Art History at the Melbourne University. Some of the images that I'm about to show are less well known. These prints represent a fraction of those that appeared throughout Europe as Philhellenism's visual appeal spread, and they enabled the subject of the Greek War of Independence to reach a mass audience. Before I progress to the visual analysis of some Philhellene works, I would like to say a few words in the context of the research project funded by the Stavros Nikos Foundation at the British School in Athens in collaboration with the National Library of Greece, this being the digital archive that's going to go live by 2024. I'm particularly enthusiastic about the collabora collaboration that a growing digital archive of unpublished material will facilitate because of my own unanswered research questions. The archive of the London Greek Committee remains an underutilised resource in relation to the formation of a historical narrative of a historical narrative of misologi and the Greek perspective of events. The archive contains, among other material, Greek letters from the town to the committee 
in London and receipts of for war expenses covered by the committee and Lord Byron. These documents not only make evidence the importance of material Philhellene support for the Greek cause, but also reveal the lobbying of the London Committee by the Greek insurgents themselves. Particularly compelling reading is the concern expressed by the defenders of Missologi upon Byron's death regarding ongoing support of the town by English Philhellenes. One document in the London Greek archive that has captivated me is in folio K4, and it's on the screen before you now. This document is an unsigned letter which suggests it's a copy. The letter is undated, but is in the second document among a but it is a, the second document among a stack of others that is that are dated August 1823. Written in Greek from Mesologi, the letter is addressed to Yorgos Braidis, who was Alexander Madvokratos' secretary at the time. This letter contains an early reference to the Suliot leader Marcos Botteris dying on the battlefield at Garbinisi as another Leonidas. Interestingly, this analogy contradicts the opinion that during the centuries of Ottoman rule, there had been little awareness of ancient heritage amongst the Greek population. Linking the modern insurgents to the ancient population of the land was important to Philhellene propaganda because it validated the idea of a regenerated Greece through the removal of Ottoman imperialism. I've not been able to identify who wrote this letter sitting in folio K4. I'm hoping that the eventual, the eventual digitization of the London Greek archive will enable them to be identified which in turn will provide further insight into the historicising of the Greek War of Independence and the role afforded to both Botsaris and Mesologi in historical accounts of the revolution. Another archival resource relevant to the development of politicised philatelism and the intellectual construction of modern Greece are the George Finlay papers. In some instances, perceptions by frontline Philhellene volunteers, such as that of George Jarvis in 1824, found Mesologi to be a miserable place owing to its damp climate and left the town due to the lack of funds. In contrast to Jarvis is the Scottish historian John George Finlay. In his notebook in March that same year, written in Mesologi, Finlay acknowledged the interest Greece had provided Western scholars and artists through classical education, and thus he supported the insurrection. Finlay was inspired to place Marco Vozeris's name beside those of Leonidas and Epomenondas in the notes he kept from his first visit to Greece between 1823 and 1824. He was an astute observer of the fluidity of allegiances across religious, regional and tribal affiliations. And he wryly noted that local groups in the region of Mesologi took up arms against the Ottomans in order to rid themselves of the detested overlord and that, quote, many of the chiefs of Romelia had at this time no idea of a national struggle. Yet Finlay, Finlay's prevailing sentimental attitude towards the Greek rebels along with his Philhellene imagination and idealism, as expressed in his notebook, demonstrate that expressions of Philhellenism had ramifications for the intellectual construction of modern Greece. A long-lasting effect of Philhellene art was the influence over the visualisation of military episodes by Greek artists, which in turn continues to exact impact on the national psyche regarding identity and the Greek War of Independence. The French poet and journalist Auguste Fabre provides an example of how Greek patriotic sacrifice and suffering were expressed through events at Mesologi. Fabre's account of the siege of Mesologi creatively incorporated antiquity and Christianity. He described Greece as being covered in blood and ruins. Excuse me. His 1826 account was part of the burst of Philhellenic activity after the fall of Mesologi. 
The question of how successful the rhetoric surrounding spilt Greek blood was in mobilising public opinion cannot be answered categorically. However, on the 6th of July in 1827, the preamble of the Treaty of London concluded by France, Great Britain and Russia to bring the war to a close referred to, quote, the necessity of putting an end to the sanguinary struggle. The rhetoric of Greek spilt blood at Mesologi, therefore, might be seen as infiltrating diplomatic policy, especially after it became evident that the Greek War of Independence was failing. Or, in the very least, revolutionary misology in art provided the West with a place in which they could anchor their politicised Philhellene imagination. Fundamental to the recreation of the fall of Mesologi as a victory seen by artists was the characterisation of the last defenders as martyrs to the Greek cause of liberty. Among the early artistic responses that associated martyrdom with triumph was Cornion's lithograph titled Apotheosis of the Martyrs of Mesologi, which circulated in August 1826 and is on the screen now. The title of this lithograph is a pain to the self-immolation of two groups among the last defenders of Mesologi who did not participate in the exodus from the town due to illness or old age. The vanquished defenders of Mesologi are presented as exemplars of heroism and patriotic sacrifice. This is seen in the depiction of them ho hovering in a liminal stage between heaven and earth. The enemy presence in the scene is subdued with only a few Ottoman vessels appearing on the lagoon, while to the right of the composition, the town burns. Cornion was able to fashion the self-immolation of the last defenders into an explosion of Greek patriotism by referencing the French Republican political rhetoric of freedom or death. Through the use of traditional French Republican imagery, this lithograph also reaffirms the principles of contemporary liberal opposition to despotic Bourbon rule. Corleone's lithograph thus serves to illustrate the international context within which Philhellene art, Greek history and French politics all came into alignment to convey patriotic sacrifice and spiritual transcendence. The lithograph displays Republican imagery seen in the coloured woodcut dating from 1793 to 1794 that is on the right of the screen. The Eye of Providence, a symbol of divine truth widely used in French Republican iconography, and the oval plaque seen in the left of the woodcut was also adopted by Cornillon in the form of a triangle radiating light in the top right hand corner. This symbol is surrounded by a circle of glory and is given further emphasis through a halo of billowing clouds upon which the seraphim wait to receive the martyrs of Mesologi. The rays emanating from this circle of glory also emphasise the infinite sanctity of the Trinity watching over events and reinforce the idea of the Greek revolution as a just and holy cause. This iconography establishes the moral victory of the Greeks in the face of the defeat at the fall of Mesologi. In this way, Corleone's apotheosis of the defeated Mesologians emphasises that no humiliation attended the town's reversion to Ottoman occupation. In addition, the lithograph exhibits that the mythology of the Homeric warrior tradition accompanied Philhellenism into its most politicised phase after the town fell back into Ottoman control. Among the clouds of smoke, rising above the burning town, stands the prominent figure of an ancient warrior embodying the heroic code of sacrifice. A priest kneeling beside the warrior holds a cross aloft in a gesture of benediction. Angels await in the middle ground to crown the Mesologian combatants with laurel victory wreaths in, in preparation for their apotheosis, while to the right another angel has descended and directs a group of insurgents upwards to glory, guiding one of them gently by the arm. Alongside the iconography of laurel crowns, palm fronds are combined with the raised cross 
to reinforce the defenders of Missolonghi as martyrs to the Greek cause. As a symbol in Christian art, the palm frond is charged with associations of victory over death and martyrdom. These two images, Bayrevo and Langlomé, are dated 1822 and 1823, respectively. They feature some of the most powerful of Philhellene iconographies. Both these lithographs contain a conflation of classical ruins with modern war debris and include the trope of the fallen Ottoman soldier, military standard or turban. The iconography denoting the trampling of the Ottomans to be a prerequisite for the revival of the Greek nation was of such abiding potency that at the Greek general Theodore Kolokodronis' funeral on the 5th of February 1843, a Turkish flag was placed in the coffin under his feet. The image on the left depicts the personification of Greece having broken the shackles on her arm arms and treading on a slain Ottoman soldier lying among broken statuary. At the centre of the second image is an armed Greek insurgent with one foot trampling an Ottoman standard and turban. He is concurrently looking upwards at two angels who are guiding the group forward. The headstones of Leonidas and Themisloplis in the right foreground remind the viewer of the connection between modern and ancient Greece as does the ancient temple in the background. Both lithographs strongly associate patriotism with religion. The first, displays, the first displays the words religion, fatherland, glory and prosperity in its corners, while the second prominently brandishes the symbol of the cross on the flag being carried by the Greek insurgent as he fervently looks to the heavens. A priest just behind him has his arms raised in earnest supplication, while the personification of justice hovering above holds a sword and a set of scales. Both items are symbolic references to the legitimacy of the Greek cause. The angels appear to be pointing the insurgents towards a city of domed buildings crowned with crescents and surrounded by a fortress. René Auguste Rondra's lithograph on the screen now, entitled Missologie Sauve, Sauve demonstrates how Philhellene politics constructed Missologie into an emblem of the Greek of War of Independence at a critical time. The lithograph was sold for the benefit of the Greek cause, as the text along the top of the image signifies, and was dedicated to the endeavours of French women, who were active in gathering funds in support of the Greek cause, particularly in 1826, when Philhellene sentiments intensified. By, the mid, by mid-1826, the Paris Greek Committee was a large movement that reached across Europe, and Philhellenism had become a fashionable cause of the day in France. The lithograph depicts the nighttime clash that resulted when the last defenders of Missologie attempted to break through the surrounding Ottoman blockade on the 11th of April. The necessity for Western intervention into the Greek insurrection is clearly conveyed through the figure of the collapsed Ottoman soldier in the centre foreground. His dislodged turban further signalling the, necess the necessary elimination of the Ottoman forces. The message is accentuated by the contrasting passages of light and dark in the composition, which draws attention to the Ottoman fallen figure. The motif of the dislodged turban was also used in 1826 by the German artist, engraver and print publisher Johann Lorenz Rogendas, who, in a similar fashion to Langlomé and in the same year as Flandre, placed a turban beside a felled Ottoman standard in the centre foreground of his composition titled Mesologi's Fall. Rugendas uniformly differentiated the defenders of Mesologi from the Ottoman forces in the battle scene, chiefly through their headwear. The Greeks appear in small red or blue round caps and the Ottomans in multicoloured turbans or fezzes with or without turbans securing them. Curiously, 
the Greek males are dressed in practically in sandal-like footwear, perhaps a reference to the ancients. The motif of the dislodged turban and fallen Ottoman standard shows that rhetoric deployed in relation to Mesologi was often not particular to the town, as it was more widely applied to revolutionary Greece. Furthermore, the presence of the priest in both Langlomes and Rogendas' lithographs, dated 1823 and 1826 respectively, indicates the strong projection of Hellene rhetoric relating to the Greek insurgents' Christian identity onto Mesologi that served to emphasise the, the unifying theme of the modern Greeks with the West. This indicates that Philhellene iconography of the fallen town of Mesologi played a role in the perpetuation of centuries-old European animosity towards the Ottoman Empire. Indeed, Rugendas's composition indicates how Mesologi, as an emblem of the Greek struggle, was used to activate European intervention into the Greek Revolution by fueling Western prejudice against the East. The caption under Rugendas's aquatint directs the viewer's attention to the explosive fire in the background, denoting the self-immolation of those unable to join the exodus. But this detail is upstaged by the depiction of the brutal desires about to be unleashed onto the female captives of the episode, including young girls. Reference to women and children was clearly an emotive tool used by Philhellene propaganda to convey to the public the intensity of Greek patriotism and the extent of the sacrifice involved. In this tableau, a turbaned Ottoman soldier has one arm firmly around the waist of a young Greek female whom he has hoisted off the ground in an aesthetic cue, cue for sexual despoliation. The sword in his other hand is about to descend on a Greek male seeking to rescue the captured female. Rukendus also depicts an elderly Greek woman kneeling at the captured girl's feet, attempting to prevent her from being carried away. Scenes of seizure can be considered as a symbol of Greece under Ottoman rule in Philhellene vernacular and connect 19th century harem images with the Greek War of Independence. These scenes are strongly suggestive that captured, captured Greek women were destined to be sold as slaves, end up in harems or forced to convert to Islam. The portrayal of another young woman, this one dead in the central foreground, with splayed arms and, heads drawn, and head drawn back is also suggestive of sexual assault rather than of combat. Her exposed right breast displays the mark of the martyr in Christian and Republican art in the form of a stylized, deep, convex wound, copiously dripping blood that provides evidence of Greek suffering. The wound confronts the viewer with an emblematic representation of spilt Greek blood at Mesologi which in turn came to denote the precarious state of in the insurrection as a whole after the town's fall. Yeah. So, and this is our last image. The importance of spilt blood to iconography of revolutionary mesologi is also evident in this final image. It shows a highly impassioned scene of a tearful but composed mother caught between uh, uh, the clash between the Ottomans and the Mesologians. The mother has an open wound on her right breast and is attempting to staunch the bleeding with a cloth while cradling her ba feeding baby. The stylized semicircular wound on the distressed, weeping mother's breast is similar in form to that of the iconography in French revolutionary and Christian art. The Christ-like wound equates the passion of Christ with the suffering of the Greek insurgents. The comparison of this mother to Christ himself rather than the suffering Virgin Mary is a remarkable feature of this Philhellene lithograph. The fact that the Greek mother also shares the iconography of the head inclined sideways to signify agony, as seen in many Christian icons, may suggest that the artists were emphasising a Christ-like passion as a prelude to the Greeks' ultimate triumph, subject to Philhellene support. Uh, classical ruins applied to mythology were a consistent trope in Philhellene art, and the broken Corinthian column in the left foreground forms an example. This is an ideologically charged trope of Philhellene art aimed at distancing Greek identity and culture from the Oriental influences and emphasising its proximity to the West. 
This is subtly adumbrated in the meander pattern on the hem of the mother's skirt. And I'll just skip a bit and go straight to my conclusion. Um, while the fall of Mesologi was seen as a catastrophe, because it was among the few remaining Greek strongholds in the country at the time, the town also became a global positive symbol of the Greek nation's commitment to the insurrection. The images examined today demonstrate the large extent to which Philhellene art was embedded in pre-existing iconography, a factor that enabled the contemporary viewer to readily interpret military episodes and thus facilitate emotional engagement. I hope this paper has demonstrated that the rhetoric of blood spilt at Mesologi combined with the image's iconographical connections to antiquity, French republicanism and Christian symbolism contributed to the most powerful of Philhellene messages. And that was that the West was abandoning the Greeks to Ottoman barbarity. Iconographies that established the Greek insurgents and Christian soldiers rising against their Islamic overlord were projected onto revolutionary mythology and contributed to the standard of account of Greek heroism in Philhellene art. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating account. Um, I, for one, didn't realize that this iconography had started uh, around the, the whole um, business of Mesolonghi. It had started so early uh, and so uh, rich, in, as you've shown in your presentation. We move on to the second uh, paper, and I see that um, Alex Gramatikos is with us. Good morning. Good morning. Alex is an instructor in the English department at Langara College on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam people in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Alex's publications include British Romantic Literature and the Emerging Modern Greek Nation, um, published in 2018, and the forthcoming collected volume, Byron and Translation, from Liverpool University Press coming out this year or next year, which he has co-edited with Maria Skina of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Alex uh, will speak on the subject of staged pleasantries and imagined communities, Alexandros Mavrokordatos, again, uh, and uh, Theodoros Kolokotronis in Romantic Era British Literature. Alex. Perfect. Uh, thank you for the intro. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I might not get another chance, so I just wanted to say uh, very quickly, well, good morning from Vancouver, for starters. Um, uh, thank you to the British School of Athens for the invitation. It's a privilege to speak today. Uh, thank you, Mikhaili, for all of the hard work you have done. Um, really sorry I couldn't be there today. Um, I'll take solace in the fact that there will be, there'll be other conferences in the future. So um, without further ado, I'll get started with my paper. Um, I will share my screen now. Hopefully everyone can see that. Great. Okay. Um, it's a tale as old as 200 years time. Theodoros Kolokotronis and Alexandros Mavrokodatos, bitter rivals who had, to put, who had to put aside their differences in order to work toward a common goal, a liberated Greece. On the one side, we have the old man of the Morea, Kolokotronis, a cleft leader who in battle secured many important victories for the Greeks, including in Tripolitza and Akrokorintos, and who was in equal measures respected and feared by his fellow Greeks. On the other side, we have Mavrokodatos, the Phanariot diplomat who sought to establish a functioning government and who successfully catered to European fantasies of a modern Greece modeled on an idealized past, particularly favored by Western Europeans. If you are Greek or know a bit about Greek society and history, as most of us here today do, you're away, you are probably aware which of the two men is considered a hero, or should I say the hero, of the revolution, and who is little remembered for his contributions to Greek freedom. In a 2021 liberal article aptly entitled, Yeti Elines Thavmazun do Kolokotroni ala Agnoun don Mavrokodato, or Why the Greeks Admire Kolokotronis, but ignore Mavrokodatos. Reporter Yorgos Milonas interviews Roderick Beaton uh, about modern perceptions of the two wartime protagonists. 
200 years after the start of the Greek Revolution. In the interview, Beaton cites a shocking 2019 poll. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, wherein 97% of correspondents see Kolokotronis os protargati de Selenikis eleftherias, or as a pioneer of Greek freedom, while only 3% view Mavrokodatos in the same way, and suggests that the Kolokotronis Mavrokodatos debate reflects broader attitudes about foreign intervention over the course of the country's 200 year history. Intervention that has sometimes been beneficial for Greece and sometimes not. While Korokotonis, as warrior, represents the true spirit of Greek autonomy, Mavro Kordatos, in his stuffy European suits, represents a sort of outside imposition. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the discussions and debates we continue to have in the 21st century about Korokotonis and Mavro Kordatos and their roles in Greek liberation were also being had throughout Europe in the 1820s, when the Greeks were actively at war with the Ottoman Empire. The majority of these 1820s accounts of the two men come from British, French, German, Italian, and American writers in a variety of forms. Uh, and for the most part, these men wish to present themselves as connoisseurs of Greek and wider Ottoman politics. In today's presentation, I'll open with a few brief excerpts from British and Italian first-person accounts before turning to fictional works by Walter Savage Landor and Jock Buckstone that attempt to reimagine Kolokotronis' and Mavro Kordatus' relationship as amicable and productive for the Greek cause. The reimagining of the Mavro Kordatus Kolokotronis relationship by, the, by these authors allows us to see an idealized version of the nation building process in the broader European imaginary. Unlike traditional travelogues, which offered a kind of opinion pieces on historical realities, the imagined conversations offer an idea of cooperation between two heroes of the revolution as a key component to the creation of a liberal, sovereign, modern 19th century nation. This, re this reimagination went hand in hand with the well-known ideas of liberté, égalité, fraternité. That is, the liberty of Greece was achievable through the equal cooperation between the two parties. But first things first, first person accounts of Kolokotonis and Mavrokordatos. The first writer I turn to is Edward Blackier, who was a founding member of the London Philhellenic Committee in 1823. In his writings about the Greek Revolution, which include four books, Blackier is complementary towards Mavrokordatos and very critical of Kolokotronis. Blackier details the difficulties Mavrokodatos encounters in trying to establish order in Greece, celebrates his perseverance in the face of hardships, and even represents the Phanariot as humble, as in the first quotation. Um, Kolokotronis, on the other hand, is a menace who prevents Greece's bid for liberty to progress. In his 1824, The Greek Revolution, Its Origins and Progress, Blackier criticizes Kolokotronis for his lack of military tactics or discipline, and questions Kolokotronis' allegiances. Uh, those are the slides, the, the quotations in blue on the slide. In 1825, Blackier published yet another book on Greece, Narrative of a Second Visit to Greece, and again he finds the opportunity to question Kolokotronis' character. At all events, I hope the example of Kolokotronis will not allow any man of honor to walk in his steps. Even more critical of Kolokotronis is the Italian author Brengari, whose Adventures of a Foreigner in Greece appeared in the London Magazine as a series from 1826 to 1827. Like Blackier, Brengari suggests that Kolokotonis, quote, had the utmost aversion to anything like regular troops, end quote, arguing that he avoided creating an army in order to maintain his power. For Brengari, Kolokotonis was a mortal enemy to liberty, that's a quote, um, who stole money that would have contributed to Greece's freedom. And here's the quote on the top here. Kolokotroni and the other chiefs took all the money, and instead of instantly marching against some other town, every one of them went home to his own house to bury his own treasure and to repose himself, writes Brengari of the siege of Tripolitsa. Mavrokodatos, on the other hand, Brengari represents as a civil and sober-minded politician who appealed to his fellow Greeks. And he has a quote, Mavrokodatos' many good qualities soon attracted him to a large party among the chief captains, um, and even suggests that Kolokotonis had to put on an appearance of cordiality with uh, Mavrokodato because everyone liked Mavrokodato so much. Um, I don't have time to talk about Pietro Gamba, who was uh, the brother of Teresa Guccioli, who is um, Lord Byron's 
um, Lord Byron's uh, partner in Italy, but he too has, he echoes the same uh, sentiments as Brengeri and Blackier. I do want to turn to Lester Stanhope, though, um, another British Philhellen who provides us with perhaps a more balanced view of Colocotronis and Mavrocordatos, or at least an alternate view. In short, unlike Brengari, Blackier, and Gamba, Stanhope is focused on appeasing Colocotronis as he considers the cleft warrior a valuable ally for the Greek freedom fighters. In a 15, February 15, 1824 letter to John Bowring, he reports that Colocotroni is in a rage because he believes Mavrocordatos is working, quote, in the interest of England, end quote, but doesn't outright dismiss Colocotronis' fears. Instead, Stanhope tells Bowring that he would like to meet with Kalukotronis to discuss the matter and even, quote, compliment the Greeks on their wise jealousy of foreign troops. Indeed, Stanhope does reach out to Kalukotronis and even extends an offer to bring his son to England for schooling. He tells Bowring, I was delighted at having in my power to make such an offer to Kalukotroni because he is the best general in Greece and his connections consist of the most powerful families. The effect, therefore, will be excellent. It will tend to conciliate the factions and to place the power of wealth under the guidance of knowledge and probably a virtue. Um, Stanhope is also sometimes complimentary of Mavrocordatos, but does not lionize him like he claims Blackery does. So, for example, in a March 1824 letter to Bowering, he writes, Mavrocordato is a good man, um, but cannot go straight. He is secretly for a mild monarchy. A thing is easy to be obtained in Greece as a mild tigerarchy, which I, I love that term, tigerarchy. Um, Stanhope gives us here a more nuanced view of both Kolokotronis and Mavrocodatos, but in general, the opinion of foreign travelers was that Kolokotronis was a sort of warlord with no systematic plan for Greek liberation, and that Mavrocodatos, despite his flaws, was dedicated to legitimizing Greece's claims for further liberation by creating the semblance of a legal guard uh, uh, government. Excuse me. All right, so I will go from there to Walter Savage Landor and his imaginary conversations. So in, an 18, in 1824, Landor published the first volume of Imaginary Conversation, which became so popular that he published a second volume in 1826. And in fact, he continued to expand it until his death in 1864. And we can see from the quotation I put on the screen um, that the work remained popular into the 20th century. So that's a quote from E.M. Forster's Howard's End. And even Fred Friedrich Nietzsche also uh, endorsed Landor as, in his imaginary conversations. In the second volume of 1826, Landor includes a fictional conversation between Kolokotronis and Mavocordatos, by this time, of course, bitter rivals in real life, though we should note by 1826, the men were playing nice, with Mavrocodatos appointing the experienced and popular Theodoros Kolokotronis as commander-in-chief of the Peloponnesian forces. In fiction, Landor emphasizes positive relations between the two men, who in their 30-page dialogue are fast friends who discuss a range of topics, including, that's lots, so uh, Greek Orthodoxy and European Christianity, Greece as abandoned by Europe, um, gods on Greece's side, the Holy Alliance, the ancient Greeks as models of good military and state practice, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a lot, but here are my main takeaways at this point in my research. First, Kolokotronis is, in Landor's portrayal of him, well-read, inquisitive, and open-minded. He sounds like a Horatio Nelson of sorts. Um, near the beginning of their dialogue, Mavrocordatos explains that Europe was persecuted and abandoned, uh, uh, that Europe has persecuted and abandoned, excuse me, the Greeks. And Kolokotronis asks almost naively, can no appeal be made to humanity and learning? Um, in general, throughout the dialogue, Mavrocordatos acts as the authority on Europe, and Kolokotronis asks him a series of well-crafted questions using the language of 19th century Western liberal elites so as to become better informed about Europe's position on the Greek Revolution. However, when it comes to knowledge about Greece, it is Kolokotronis who shines in the dialogue. Despite charges of Kolokotronis' lack of military strategy, leveled by Blackier, for example, Landor's version of the warrior admires the ancient Greeks' military science and tells his colocular, uh, quote, the Greeks have performed in the last three years as many arduous actions as their ancestors ever performed within the same period and have shown a constancy as they have never exhibited since the days of Pericles. 
here, we have Kolokotoni's drawing a positive comparison between ancient and modern Greeks, when so often such, comparis uh, such comparisons were to the detriment of modern Greeks. And of course, we have Landor himself drawing such a comparison as a way to remind his English readers what the Greeks had achieved by this point, 1826, in the revolution. Later in the dialogue, Kolokotronis makes reference to Ulysses. He says that Greece shall rise again, just like the ancient Greek hero did under the wand of a palace, when his wrinkles were smoothed and his tattered garment cast away from him. And in what I consider one of the most fascinating parts of the dialogue, he refers to the wild theories of Solon, Aristides, Epaminondas, Phokeion, and the Greek playwrights. In brief, Kolokotonis argues that these historical figures espoused wild theories that, quote, unite men in justice and amity, that gave birth and nurture to every art and every science, and that even taught reason and humanity to the despot who lashed the sea, Xerxes. Sure, this roll call of names likely reflects Landor's rather than Kolokotonis' reading list, but by representing the Greek warrior as even somewhat knowledgeable of the classics, Landor moves away from characterizations of Kolokotronis as rude and uncultured and aligns him with, for lack of a better word here, European values. I should note here that in Apomimonevmata, or his memoirs, uh, I knew I was going to trip over that, Kolokotronis does mention having access to books about ancient times when he's in Zakynthos, so there's a bit of a reality here. Perhaps even more importantly, Landor deploys the classics here as a way to critique a Europe that admires the ancient Greek past, but does nothing currently to liberate the space and its people, a common Philhellenic argument to be sure. By making Kolokotoni sound like an educated gentleman of enlightened society, Landor is able to make the cleft leader more palpable to his readership, who has a very specific ideas about how a national hero should be. This would ideally attract further support for the Greek cause in British elite circles. Throughout the imaginary conversation between Mavrokodatos and Kolokotronis, Landor emphasizes the many subjects upon the, which the two men agree, rather than their real-life animosity. And foremost of these subjects is Europe's shameful disregard for Greece's well-being. It will likely not come as any surprise, but Austria and Russia are in for a drubbing, though Landor's most, most sustained critique is actually reserved for England. According to Mavrokordatos, England is full of party men at all class levels, and he claims that the country is spoiling its reputation as, quote, once the favorite of liberty, end quote, by affiliating itself with the Holy Alliance. Tongue firmly in cheek, Mavrokordatos tells Kolokotronis that he hopes God, the Almighty, quote, retains in the government of the Seven Owls His Excellency Sir Thomas Maitland, so that the people shall never cease to sigh for union with us. And that likewise, in his infinite mercy, he may remove all impediment to his excellency by removing forever Lord Guilford, in whose presence learning would almost forget her losses and dismember Greece, her sufferings. As Anthony Hobson comments, though Guilford wanted to establish an institution of higher learning on the Ionian Islands, quote, this intention was consistently frustrated by the governor, Sir Thomas Maitland, end quote. Clearly, Lander knew about this situation and takes the opportunity in his dialogue to promote Maitland's heavy-handed rule as an expedient to Greek unity. The Ionians would become sick of British rule more quickly with Maitland in the lead. The joke here, though light, does point to a more serious issue of the Ionian Islands' protectorate status and how the British were preventing the true desires of the island's inhabitants. Listening to Mavrokodatos, Kolokotornis is appalled by England's conduct and doesn't understand why a country that is free would prevent another from attaining its liberty. And the second quote here, I cannot see why when I myself am shaven, I should break the razor or hinder the use of one in those who want it. Throughout the dialogue, Kolokotornis, though disappointed with the English government's current position on Greece, attempts to foresee a future alliance between the two nations. In real life, of course, Kolokotornis is most associated with Russia. But Landor's version is different. Quote, I hope we are not yet reduced to imitate the Russians in anything. The least inventive of all the human races and the most hostile to all inventions can hardly be presented to Greeks for a model, he tells Mavrokordatos. Of course, this entire dialogue flows from the pen of a British author and thus is not really a true Greek perspective. This point is never clearer uh, in the dialogue uh, than when Kolokotornis tells Mavrokordatos, and I quote, Military campaigns are formed as much by a receipt as custards and sieges as cheesecakes. 
I doubt Golokotoni said custards and cheesecakes on the mind. No matter though, um, the point of Landor's imaginary conversations is in part an emphasis on the imaginary. He isn't trying to hide that this conversation isn't real. It is the Philolene in Landor who wants to advertise Greece's leaders as unified in their mission rather than at odds. But it goes beyond that. What the imagined conversation between the two men allows is for scrutiny of England and its position vis-a-vis -vis Greek independence. Mavrokodatos and Kolokotones are, as represented by Landor, two men struggling to achieve their aims because of Europe's resistance to positive change. Landor critiques England, but in doing so, also privileges England and demonstrates that there are actually two Englands, those the England that prevents progress in Europe and the English that is supportive of liberation movements like the Greek Revolution. So by way of conclusion, I'm going to turn to John Baldwin Buckstone's The Maid of Athens, or The Revolt of the Greeks, which was staged at the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane, in October of 1829. The main character in this play is Lord Byron, who is organizing a siege of Lepanto, not Paktos, which never actually occurred in real life, though he and Mavrokordatos had been planning it in 1824. In the 1829 play, Mavrokordatos and Kolokotornis appear on stage together for one scene, and are, just like in Landor's imaginary conversations, cordial. In the scene, Byron notes the importance of strengthening ourselves by some popular names, um, the latter of which include Kolokotornis and Mavokordatos. The 1829 audience watching this play would have known that Byron had been dead for five years now, and that everything they are seeing, including his interactions with Kolokotornis and Mavokordatos, that's fiction. That doesn't, however, discount the political importance of staging a Byron and Kolokotornis Mavrokordatos alliance and framing this partnership as ideal both for Greece and England. Like Lander before him, Buxton and the Maid of Athens reimagined the European Greek and Greek Greek relationships at a time, 1829, when Greece's future as an independent nation was still up in the air. Like Landor too, Buxton suggests that England had the obligation to take a more humanitarian role in Greece's future. This work, read together with Landor's, tells us that the British intellectual elites were more than willing to entertain the fictional idea of an idealized nation-building project led by two different heroes who joined their respective fields of expertise to forge a free Greece. So on a final note, I'll just say that works like Landor's and Buckstone's, which play up the imaginary, help us better understand the role fiction played in promoting and building cross-cultural relations. However, if it's the case that authors like Landor and Buxton had to create versions of Mavrokardatos and Kolokotornis who were more amenable to a British public, where does this leave the real-life Greek figures who fought for Greece's liberation? Do the literary works I've discussed today demonstrate the limits of literary representation and literature's forging of transcultural relationships? Do Mavrokardatos and Kolokotornis merely become mouthpieces for British liberals like Landor and Buxton, who are critical of their country's conduct but nevertheless convinced that England represented Greece's best political partner. These questions require further reflection, of course, but for now I'll just say that in the mid to late 1820s, it was necessary to represent Greece in specific ways, European-oriented, allied with Britain, educated about the ancient past, and so on. However, the cost is that these characterizations clearly affected Europe's understanding of Greek people's desires, and still today, influence the way that we read the country and its people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for um, making us aware of, of these literary uh, reflections of the Greek independence struggle, um, particularly how two, two specific characters are represented. Our third paper now um, is by William Barton, who was awarded his PhD in Classics at King's College London in 2015. His research interests focus on the use of Latin and ancient Greek in scholarly literature in the early modern period from about 1500 to 1800. His current project, which is devoted to the secret Greek diary of the Hellenist Karl Benedict Hase, is based at the University of Innsbruck in Austria and uh, cover, runs from uh, 2023 to 2028. The title of his paper, Cultural Philhellenism in 19th Century Paris, the Correspondence of George Theocharopoulos and Charles Benoit Haas. Over to you. 
Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and once more uh, to the organizers of this conference uh, for uh, the invitation to be here. So the Franco-German scholar uh, Charles Benoit or, or Karl Benedict Hase has been ranked among the most outstanding Greek philologists active in Paris at the beginning of the 19th century. From his position within the French Academy, Charles Benoit articulated his support for a regeneration of Greece with a personal grand, uh, brand of what's been called cultural philhellenism. Haza activated his substantial philhellenic networks to the benefit of Georges Georgos Theokaropoulos from Patras, for example, whose program of linguistic pedagogy saw the production of numerous literary and didactic works in the first half of the 19th century. The broad strokes of Haza's support for Theokaropoulos within the Parisian literary landscape have, has already dro drawn the attention of historians of Philhellenism. I'm, I'm thinking here particularly of Sandrine uh, Mouffroy and uh, Christos Moulias. But the details of how precisely this cultural Philhellenism functioned from the bottom up remain somewhat obscure. So after an introduction to Haza and Theokaropoulos, the key figures in this story. Uh, the paper aims to put the flesh on the bones of this form of Philhellenism in action. So first about this man, Hase. Karl Benedict uh, was born in Thüringen in Germany. He attended school in Weimar before enrolling in the Faculty of Theology and Philosophy at the University of Jena in 1798. Hase later decided for classical philology and switched to the University of Helmstedt. His broad range of interests saw him continue to attend uh, courses in Jena, however, until 1801. During this time, Haase had the opportunity to learn contemporary spoken Greek from uh, Drosos Mansolas, then also uh, a student in Jena. By the summer of 1801, Haase was on his way to Paris, on foot and without a formal passport, apparently attracted by the revolutionary and republican spirit of consulate France. On his arrival in the French capital, Hase sought out first the academy in the hope of finding employment, to no avail in the first place. But before long, the young Karl Benedict struck lucky. He was introduced uh, by chance uh, to Panagiotis Kodrikas. He made an impression on this prominent figure of the Greek Enlightenment with his command of Greek, and thus established a first contact with the Parisian intellectual community. In 1805, he won a post at the manuscript department at the Bibliothèque Imperiale, uh, then Royal and National uh, de France, and became familiar with figures in the upper echelons uh, of the Parisian intellectual scene. He came into contact with uh, Jean-Francois Champollion, for example, as well as Corais during his earliest years in Paris. Hase became professor of modern Greek and Greek paleography at the city's École des Langues Orientales Vivantes in 1816. By 1824, he was elected a member of France's Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, and he was later elected as a member of the Académie de Wissenschaften in Göttingen and Berlin-Brandenburg, as well as the Russian Academy of Sciences. A specialist of late antique and Byzantine literature and history, Hase counted among France's exceptional specialists in Greek language and literature in his time. He's known particularly, uh, still today, for his editions uh, of, of Byzantine historians, uh, particularly the Editiones Principes of uh, Leo the Deacon's Historia, John the Lydian's uh, De Ostentis, uh, for example. From 1823 uh, until his death, Hase uh, had a leading role in the editorial committee of the Dindorf Brothers' uh, nine-volume updated edition of Henri Etienne's uh, Thesaurus Graecae Linguae, the new Stephanus, as it was called. Indicative of the scholar's lifelong philhellenic interests, however, he also produced an updated uh, and annotated edition of Choiseul Gouffier's bestseller, Le Voyage Pittoresque uh, dans l'Empire Ottoman in 1842. Sadly, I don't have a picture of that here. The list of Hauser's articles and um, book reviews um, covers a, a similar breadth of subjects. His intimate knowledge of the Greek languages, classical, Byzantine, and modern forms was almost unique in his time in, in Western Europe. And it also allowed him to commit a series of forgeries that have left scholars guessing until the late 20th century. Haas's expertise in, in Greek culture, language, and history gave him a privileged perspective on the emergence of the new Greek state and the shaping of its cultural identity within his lifetime. 
Scholarship places Hase as one of the faces of Philhellenic culture in early 19th century Paris. He prioritized collaboration with numerous Greek men of letters with whom he often entered into contact through his position at the library in particular. I'm thinking here of uh, Minoides Minas or Rizos Rangavis, among others. But if Haza's Greek friends recognized him as a Philhellene explicitly, they use this term in his letters, um, it's perhaps above all because he answered them with benevolence to their request and endeavored to help particularly those worst off by leveraging his connections in the French capital. Haza thus intervened particularly in favor of the author of educational works and translations, uh, this Georges Theocharopoulos. He was born in 1770 in Patras, his native town. From 1806 to 1820, he worked as a tutor to the sons of Constantinos Ypsilanti. After the Ypsilanti's defeat at Dragatsani, Theocharopoulos went to Russia where he continued his work as a teacher. In the interests of further advancement and a new direction for his literary leanings, he moved to Paris around 1825. There he considered his work as a teacher uh, in both ancient and contemporary spoken Greek, but increasingly devoted himself to the publication of didactic works. Theo Charopoulos's activity in this time was frenetic. His first book was the Grammatiki Galiki to Kiriu Letelier, Metaphrastisa Istinioteran Eleniki Glossan, published in Paris in 1827 at the presses of Didot, as we see here. In the foreword, he makes explicit the decision to begin his published oeuvre with this work as an aid to cementing relationships between the Greeks and the French. Theocharopoulos writes of a special understanding for the noble feelings and sympathy that Greece inspired in the French and of the common love for freedom and glory. We've, we've heard this a few times uh, in this panel already. Indeed, the work was published on a subscription supported by the Philhellenic Committee of Paris, which also took responsibility for delivering several hundred copies to the provisional government of Greece in order to ensure its distribution. The body of the work also provides some information about Theocharopoulos' linguistic views. Though Metaphrastisa is in Neoteran Glossan, uh, Theocharopoulos strongly advocates the use of the archaic language, the form he also used for his work, uh, correspondence with Haase. In the following year, Theocharopoulos published his Dialogue Familier, suivi uh, the Dialogue de Fenelon en français, anglais et grec which presents learners with the three texts in parallel columns uh, to facilitate access to the information. In the same year, uh, Theocharopoulos collaborated with Vladimir Brunet de Prel on another trilingual edition of the Maxime et Réflexion Morale, the Duc de la Roche-Foucault, which we see here. Brunet de Prel had been a student of Theocharopoulos and Hase from a young age and we'll return to the, the, the triangular relationship between the three in the third section of this paper. So after about five years in Paris, Theocharopoulos left the French capital to begin his journey home. His route was arduous and he relied directly on his continued publications for funds to pay his way. He now produced a French translation, uh, 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 a translation sorry, of the French constitution into ancient Greek, uh, here we see La Charte Constitutionnelle des Français, and uh, the Poésie Lyrique de l'Anacreon Moderne uh, Anastase Christopoulos, both printed in Strasbourg in 1831. I think it's interesting that we get uh, this modern Anacreon before the actual name of the, of the author here. <coughs> this effort to integrate uh, Greek into a wider European literary frame and vice versa, actually, is confirmed in the preface of Theocharopoulos's French, English, Modern Greek, and Ancient Greek vocabulary, the next work published in 1834 in Munich, where the author was now staying on his journey east. This was a, a truly cosmopolitan work. Adapted from Poppleton's English textbook, it's supplemented by additional notes drawn largely from the writings of Corais. Moreover, while the title is formulated only in French and Greek, the book opens with a prolegomena in German. Theocharopoulos' uh, argument, uh, yeah, I should say I, I wasn't able to find a picture of this for, for my presentation. Uh, 
so Theocropolis's argument in this prolegomena, the German one, um, is draws, draws on a large corpus of ancient authors and is based on the notion of a German Bildungsideal, understood, I think, as an equivalent to the Greek um, pedia, as employed by Korais. Following this work, Theochoropoulos finally made it to Yassi on the Romanian-Moldovan border before arriving in his native Patras in uh, 1837. Here he lived until the uh, 1850s working as a teacher and reliant on the product of his continued work as an author and editor. So the five letters uh, from Theochoropoulos to Haza, to which we'll now turn, are um, preserved in Weimar and Paris in the collections of uh, Karl Benedict's papers. Four of the pieces, as we see here, a couple of them, are written in this archaizing form of Greek. The fifth addresses Haase formally in his function as a member of the French Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, and does so in French. Here's the, here's the uh, envelope. These letters, alongside his exchanges with other friends and colleagues, tell the story of, of Theochoropoulos' arrival in Paris, his search for employment among the Philhellenic community, his ambitions and efforts to achieve them in the process of what he calls a regeneration of his Greek homeland. Let's now take a closer look at these letters to view the nuts and bolts of this cultural support for Theochoropoulos. What exactly does this cultural Philhellenism mean? Well, in the first letter, preserved in Paris, uh, it reveals immediately the sort of practical aid available to newly arrived Greeks in, in the literary city. The letter uh, from November 1827 shows that at, at an early moment of financial need, Haase was able to present Theochoropoulos with three concrete modes of support. The first came in the form of a recommendation to the Russian noble family Dolgoruki, where Theochoropoulos became a teacher of Greek to the young son of the family, Prince Vladi. The second was some financial aid to the sum of 40 francs, as we see here, uh, which, I was able, which I found was a, equivalent to more or less a month's rent in contemporary Paris. Finally, Haase employed uh, Theochoropoulos directly as a, as a language training partner, what we might call a buddy, a language buddy today, to keep his modern Greek skills up. At this early moment of exchange, however, Theochoropoulos already shows himself impatient for more meaningful employment. Uh, in particular, his role as a teacher to the young Vladi, apparently a troublesome and prank-prone youth, was of little satisfaction to the scholar from Patras. He thus finishes the letter by asking Haase directly for more financial generosity to help him further onto his own two feet. The next letter reveals in detail the role of Haase as an intermediary for Theochoropoulos to the wider Philhellenic community in Paris. The piece is addressed at once to Haase at his home address, but also to his student, friend, and successor at uh, L'Ecole de Langue Orientale Vivante, Vladimir Brunet de Prel, who I mentioned earlier. Brunet de Prel had taken private lessons in modern Greek with Theo Theochoropoulos already before he became a university student of Haase. His father, Charles Brunet, a career diplomat, had made his Parisian home a meeting place for Greeks in France. On the back of this, Vladimir espoused his desire to contribute through the pen to education and the civilization of Greece at a young age. These are his words. One product was the translation of the Maxime de la Rochefoucauld into Greek, which was the direct result of an exercise in translation given to Brunet de Prel by Theochoropoulos. Theochoropoulos then expanded, corrected, and eventually took the credit for the work in 1828. The choice of the Maxime uh, de la Rochefoucauld responded to the desire to import in Greece a work that its translators considered particularly appropriate to the abilities and needs uh, of the language and Greek culture. This is what they say in their preface. The fundamental role that Haase played as an intermediary in this project is acknowledged at once by the dedication of the printed book to him uh, on an elaborate page in the preliminaries, as well as the extensive references to the inner workings of uh, Brunet, Brunet de Prel's and Theochoropoulos' professional, professional relationship within the co-addressed letter. Another element of this relationship's inner workings, as I'm calling them, was a second of Haase's students and classmate of uh, Brunet de Prel, 
Felix Desiré Deck, whom Theocharopoulos mentions affectionately in this co-addressed letter. Deck was, as Brunet de Prel for the Maxime, instrumental in the production of Theocharopoulos's first book, the translation of Letelier's French grammar. Once again, the work is dedicated to the Philhellenic linchpin, uh, Hase, who had put Theocharopoulos in touch with his pupil, Deck, to take care of the French proofreading. Uh, we've got the uh, dedication to Hase here on, the, on your right. Uh, once more, the translation of Letelier's French grammar responded to Theochoropoulos's intention to give young Greeks a means to solid intellectual formation thanks to the study of what he calls the language of philosophy and science. The third, uh, much shorter piece was addressed from Brussels to pa Hazard in Paris on the same day as the longer co-addressed letter. It brings to life once more the central place that Hazard's Philhellenism could play in the publication and pedagogical plans of Theocharopoulos. The letter begins with apologies for silence on the part of, of the Greek when he left Paris before the immediately switches to a request uh, of the literary nature we now expect. We learn Theocharopoulos is planning to produce an edited Greek Latin edition of the Gospels with notes and biographies of the evangelists. This was a moment of ambition, uh, like many in, in Theochoropoulos' uh, bi biography, which, which was never realized. On his travels, and with a shortage of access to book materials, he implores Hazard to send him, via uh, Brunet de Prel, any material he might have on the topic, with comments on its accuracy and notes on its use. The same tone is evidenced in the last surviving letter to, to Hazard, sent from Strasbourg, in uh, Strasbourg in 1831. Having put Brunet de Prel and Eck in contact with the Greek author, and having acted as a, as a go-between in earlier exchanges, which we've just commented on, Hase is now on the sharp end of an urgent call from his Greek friend for contact and for money from both of the younger Frenchmen. In need of funds to launch the publication of the translation of uh, Christopoulos's Lyrica, Theochoropoulos wants to get his hands on a collection of Greek books that he's left as a deposit in Paris. George emphasizes to Hase that he needs to release the funds wrapped up in this printed material and fast. Finally, Theochoropoulos asks Hase straightforwardly to use his influence to convince both Brunet de Prel and de Eck to, play, to pay a, a series of the production costs for his new book, a total of 380 francs, so no little. This request is not quite as brazen as it might first appear because both Brunet de Prel and Deck had contributed to the translation of Christopoulos, uh, checked the proofs, proposed corrections, and wrote a part of the introduction. If this translation of Christopoulos corresponded to the literary dimension of Theochoropoulos' Philhellenic and pedagogic program, the political education of the Greek people was, as he writes, the exclusive goal of the translation into ancient Greek of the French Constitutional Charter of 1830 by Theochoropoulos. The booklet was published thanks to the financial support of Hellenists, men of letters, and former members of the Philhellenic uh, Committee of Paris, including representatives of the French political and economic elites, who Theochoropoulos was able to access once more through Hase in May 1831. Theochoropoulos addressed his French letter, number four in our collection, directly to Hase, as I've mentioned, as, his, as a respected member of the society. The missive presents Theochoropoulos' profile, his curriculum vitae, publication list, and the financial straits in which he finds himself. Without direct mention of his publication plans, the letter makes straightforward human appeal to the dignitaries of the Société as philanthropists. After his signature, the Hase in, uh, includes as a, an, an appendix a list of donations already made to, to Theochoropoulos along with the amounts sent. The list begins with the name of the Duchesse de Vicence, then Adrienne de Canessy, and the second name in the list is Hase himself, a sort of model donator from the Academy. The list continues in Theochoropoulos' French hand until the end of the page, where I hope you can see new donations are added in a second hand. These include uh, still further names of nobility, Le Comte de Crassy, uh, Baron d'Acier, 
alongside other members of the French Academy. The personal connection of Haase to Theophoropoulos in acting as the personal addressee of this letter to the society, where the, where the application for funding was submitted. The first academic name on the list to which names were added after the presentation of this request. And then the appearance of his name among the list of benefactors at the end of the Charte Cont Constitutionnelle, which this uh, money eventually funded, reveal, I think, sharply, or put into sharp profile, Haas's influence in activating the support of the Philhellenic networks in Paris. So three sentences to conclude here. We've seen how Haas had played the role of a first point of contact, friend, mediator, advisor, and scientific guarantor to Theochoropoulos, among a series of other Greek intellectuals and authors who arrived in Paris in the 19th century. Encouraged by their common scientific and pedagogical intentions, authors in this band of society were concerned not only with the academic quality and usefulness of their work, but also with its uh, pointed dissemination. The products of the publication in these circles, like that of our representative here today, Georgos Theochoropoulos, revolved around the project of contributing, as he says, to the regeneration of Greece through educational and cultural alignment. Haase contributed to this project as what we can now, with some detail, call a cultural philhellenist from his position in the French Academy. I hope to have shown uh, in some detail the gritty ways in which this actually worked through these letters. Thanks very much.